in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. This is the second week of Misra, and we read a gospel account that includes wine. Last week we read a, a gospel account on Sunday that was about the vine. And this is basically the season for harvesting grape and preparing to make wine in the countryside. Those who are familiar with this process, you know, this is the time to do that. And maybe uh, preparing for it. So the Gospels that were brought to us in this, the, the first two months of, first weeks of month of Misra is about wine. So it's very suitable for the season. We might not be familiar with it because we live in a, a more urban community and we are far away from that process and you get your wine from the grocery store or your grapes. So you really don't know what happens behind the bottle and the bag of grapes that you get. But this is what happens. So the, the beginning of this gospel, it's, a, it's a, an invitation to eat, an invitation to dinner. There was a man, his name was Levi, that's a very Jewish name, and that Levi was uh, working with the IRS of the time, you know. So whenever you hear from the IRS, it's a bad news. The Roman IRS. Yeah. So uh, except for that one check that gives you a refund, you, would, you don't want to hear from them. Romans never give refunds. They, they never give refunds. So they, they have a saying in Egypt, the vultures don't throw checks. <laughs> so he was one of those vultures. And they had a system that the tax collectors will what they collect. Of them, I'm not talking about the IRS today. I'm just talking about, you know, <laughs> don't get me in trouble. They, most of them were thieves. And the people hated them big time. Hated them big time. They didn't like them at all. Because they didn't care. If, if it was a widow or an orphan, they didn't care. And uh, the, the Jews, the common Jew, would really look at them with um, contempt and also with fear. They're afraid because they can call the Roman soldiers for them. They can call the police. So, but this one was sitting at the place where they collect the taxes and Jesus passed by him. We don't need really to know the details. It's a very amazing piece of the gospel that is very, it's one of those mysteries. You really don't know exactly what happened. Because all what it says that uh, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. He was busy, most probably, and Jesus passed by, and he said to that one, especially that one, follow me. Okay, we were not told if Levi had known Jesus before, had met him before. We don't have any idea. The next verse says, so he left all, rose up and followed him. Not only that, not only that. But Levi invited Jesus for dinner. That's very, you know, perplexing. Very perplexing. The gospel doesn't say anything. Who wrote this piece? Levi. <laughs> he's the one who wrote it. He, he's telling us a personal story. He's not, this is not a, an eyewitness. This is the person himself. So he made him a great feast. In the other gospel in St. Luke, I think, or St. Mark, they tell you that the, the feast was lavish. Levi, he's a being, being modest. He, he just really made a really big feast and invited him to his house, and he, Jesus sat with him. Guess who will be there, too? The rest of the IRS, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is his community. Because he is hated, who, who, who is going to be his friends? The, the, the community, the rest of the people, the regular people don't like him at all. You think he will be able to invite anybody? Absolutely not. So who's going to, he's going to invite? Family the rest, yeah, the family and the rest of the thieves. So Jesus was in the den of thieves that day. And not only that, but also people who would not be comfortable to be seen with regular people. You might talking about prostitutes. You might talking about you might be talking ex thieves, you know, ex prisoners, stuff like that. So when when Levi himself was describing it, he was nice. He said, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others. 
<laughs> others uh, who sat down with them. That immediately instigated the, the goodies, the, the good people. They're so good people. And the scribes and Pharisees, these are the good people. The Sunday school teachers, with all due respect. They, they so got, they, got they got triggered. It's almost like Jesus pulled the trigger on them. And they start complaining against his disciples. They never, you see in the gospel, they never talk to him directly. They're afraid of him. So who they go to? What is they call it, the, in Egypt they call it the law wall that they can jump over? The disciples, the rest of the disciples. Now, they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? That's provoking. They think of Jesus, okay, if the, if the public think of Christ as a prophet, if he think, they think of him as a righteous man of God, that is the, the picture. We are righteous too, the, the tax collectors, uh, I'm sorry, the Pharisees would say, we are righteous too, we never do that. What are you trying to say? You're, you're damaging our image. You're damaging our prestige. When we think of him as a prophet and he goes to sit with those and eat with them, then either one of us is, one of us is doing wrong, either him or us. Jesus answered and said to them, so one thing I want to tell you about the Lord, he doesn't let his disciples be cornered. He's always protecting them, always. And he's going to ask them this at the end. He's going to say, when I was with you, did you need anything? They said, no, Lord. And what he says, um, whoever doesn't have a sword, let him sell his garment and buy a sword, meaning defend yourself. I'm not going to be with you. He's going to say something else here too about not being with them, what will happen. So he's going to answer the, ta the, uh, the Pharisees, the righteous people, the, those who think they are righteous, directly and prevent them from harassing his disciples. And he said, so he hears them talk to the disciples, he steps in and he speaks. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. If I have one hour to spend and I have a sinner and I have a very saintly person, who should I spend it with? Jesus would say, the sinner, that he needs me, she needs me, you don't need me. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And then I'm going to stop here because the second part of the gospel is about the wine. But let's stop here. This is the first question. Why do you eat with sinners? Why do you eat with people who are not worthy of you? And here is something for us. If you are a head of household, if you are the father or your mother or even a single mother or a single father and you don't think much of yourself and you say, why would Jesus be at my house? The gospel says that's wrong. You're acting like the Pharisees. Jesus will be at your house, even if you think you are the worst person in the world. Actually, if you are the worst person in the world, just invite him. Just invite him and see. So today, this gospel is to the household. I tell you why the church means it that way. Because what did St. Paul talk about earlier? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Parents, don't provoke your children. What's he talking to? Household. He's talking to servants. Serve your masters. Every big household has servants. And masters, don't forget, you are servants of your master. So if you treat them bad, don't expect good things from your master. So that you get your reward. Treat your servants well. Today, we don't have slaves. You know, you barely have somebody hired to clean your house. But you might be working on, on, on a job that you actually supervise people. You might be a, a, a store owner who you have people under you. This is part of your household. Very commonly, that your children know the people that work with you. And very commonly, the, the people that work with you know your children and your wife. And you're almost like one household. This is your household. So what is it that Jesus is trying to say today? Don't ever think that because you are a sinner or you're not doing what you ought to do, that Christ is not in your house. Or he will be disgusted to be sitting with you at the table. Don't ever think that there is anything in you or anything you do that will prevent him from coming and staying at your house. Does that give me hope? Absolutely. 
He doesn't come alone. If he comes, uh, I, I don't like this. In Asyut at one time, they used to have that song, Jesus alone, Jesus alone. He doesn't come alone. Jesus never comes alone. He comes with his mother, and he comes with his disciples. He comes with the angels. Jesus comes to stay at your home with his, the, whole, the whole family. So he gets his family to stay with your family so that the two family becomes one. That's why at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, we see Jesus going to a wedding. And who is there too? His apostles and all and else. Who else? St. Mary. So he brings them and they have a dialogue in your house. They have a dialogue in your house. Like in the, in the other wine occasion when St. Mary noticed they have no wine. They, nobody told her anything. She noticed they have no, no wine. She can have the motherly eye where she looks for the needs. You know, the father usually doesn't really much know uh, the details of what they need. It's usually the, the mother. They say, oh, they, they, it's time to prepare food. It's time, uh, uh, my little son doesn't look good. Uh, let me see, to check, she checks his forehead. St. Mary does that. She does that. And she speaks to Christ on our behalf. So we, when you call Christ to, to be in your house, and we, should all to, we, we ought to do that regularly. Lord, stay with us. Like the two disciples of Emmaus, when it was sunset, and they were about to, uh, the day was about to end, they told Jesus, what? Linger a little bit. Stay with us here. We don't want you to leave so quickly. We want you here. So every man here and every woman should ask Christ to their house. I'll tell you something also, that when you ask Christ to your house, it pleases him and he will defend you. It pleases him and it defends you if any evil spirit or any wicked thought comes that says, Lord, you shouldn't go there. That's not your place. He's going to defend you. The second piece, how do you do that? How do you invite Christ to your house? Let me just say the pra practical thing. Early morning, when you wake up, before you do anything, call on him. Call on him in the morning. Ask him, today you should stay with me. Stay in my house, stay in my workplace. Because he first visited Levi at his work, and then later he stayed with him in his house. Then the next piece, which is interesting also, says, um, they have a question. So the first question, why you eat with the sinners? The second question, why your disciples don't fast? The disciples apparently was not fasting. I, we don't hear about them in the gospel fasting at all. Jesus fasted, but they didn't fast. But did the disciples fast? Absolutely. In St. Paul's letters, he said, in many fastings, St. Paul was almost always fasting, and the apostles fasted. When did they fast? After he ascended. After he ascended. But Jesus is, Jesus is telling them that, said to them, why, they asked him, why do the disciples of John, the Baptist, fast and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? They're always going from one house to another, so they couldn't... <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't catch him doing something wrong, staying with sinners. Now it's about the food, right? Okay, you're eating with sinners? Okay. But why are you eating all the time? <laughs> so the second question is, why you eat and drink all the time? And he said to them, this is a feast time. I am here. I'm on earth. It's a feast time. When Jesus was with the apostles, and later on the apostles, their eyes were open and they realized what was going on. They had no idea that they were with God. He was with them for three and a half years. Can you imagine? This is heaven. He brought heaven down, and now they are with him three and a half years. They didn't realize it. You might be, you know, thinking how glorious it was. No, they didn't realize it was like babies. And even when they got up to the mountain and saw him in his glory, they were... Uh, so stuporous, they were so tired and they couldn't get the whole thing. So he said the bridegroom, that's Jesus, is with them. It's like the, the wedding feast. But then after the bridegroom is gone, they will be fasting. Then he gave this example so that we all understand what he's talking about. He gave a parable or a simile 
or a very mysterious uh, piece of uh, description. So he's describing two things. One, a cloth that's rotten, that's rotting away. It's like very soft and is about started to be uh, broken. He said, what do you usually do when you have a, a very important piece of cloth that started to be very broken? What do you do? What, what commonly is done is you patch it. How do you patch it? You go to a, a cloth merchant, get a piece, try to make it as similar as possible, a, a new piece, and you do what? You, you cut that rotten piece and you sew the small, the new piece instead. He said, but what happens when you do that? If you're using, in the time of Jesus, there was no polyester. There was no, you know, manufactured cloth. It's all natural. When you put an old piece of cloth in the washing, in the hot water, what happens? It sh if it's new, it shrinks. But after you do it one time, what happens? It doesn't shrink anymore. So the new shrinks, the old stays the same. So when you patch it and you put it in the hot water, what happens? The new piece will start shrinking and pulls the very dying pieces off. And it starts to tear again. He said that. He said, when you form, when you feel, if no one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. So this is the first piece. The second one, he said, no one puts new wine into old wine skin. In, the, in those times, they didn't have the carboils. You know what a carboil is? A big jar of glass. At the top of it, there is a valve. It leaks gas. It doesn't allow air to come in as a water seal. We do have that now. But in those times, they didn't have it. What did they have? What did they use to do uh, ferment grape juice in? Goat skin. Goat skin. Sheep skin. When you get the sheep skin in the beginning, it's very elastic. It's a lot of collagen. And that, that protein is, can be expanded, can be stretched. So when it's fresh, it smell, doesn't smell good, but after a while with the wine and the fermentation, it becomes not bad. It gets to be expanded. You, get, you put the, pour the juice and you tie it nicely. Because it's skin, it allows some air to come out. It starts to inflate, becomes like a balloon. And then after a while, it stops and becomes rigid. And then they open it and they pour the, the juice, which became wine. But what if you take an old wine skin? You know what's an old wine skin like? An old skin like? If it's been used before, it would look like the drum top. Have you seen the drum top? It's very hard. If you put the juice in it and it starts to expand, what will happen? it will break. It's not elastic. It doesn't expand. So what he's saying, he said, now no one puts new wine in old wine skins or else the new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilled and the wine skins will be ruined. But new, one must, new wine must, must be put into new wine skins and both are preserved. So he's saying, you can't take an old thing and use it for a new thing, especially if the new thing is still expanding or still shrinking. If you do that, you're not going to have anything. So what's he talking about here? Fasting. Let me just put this clearly and straight to you. He said, they asked him, why can't we use the, why don't you use the same system of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the t disciples of John the Baptist? They are fasting all the time. Why don't you follow them? Just fast as they fast. You're eating all the time. Your disciples eat all the time. He said, this will happen when I am gone. Because their system of fasting is not going to match the old system of fasting. They, the Jews, fasted Yom Kippur. They fasted with the beginning of every Hebrew month. They fasted in the occasions of their salvation for Passover. <clears throat> but what will the church fast for? These are the stories that they fasted to remember. What the church will fast for? We'll fast for him. When he fasted, we will fast with him. This is not in the Jewish system. We will fast with the apostles waiting for the Holy Spirit or after the Holy Spirit descended so that we can prepare for service. 
we will fast for St. Mary's, the revelation where her body gone. Those fastings are not going to match the Jews. The Jews will never recognize those events. We will fast those fastings. He said, when I'm ascending, there will be a totally different system of fasting. If you try to combine the two of them, what will happen? There will be no days of break fast. There will be, there will be continuous fasting because you put this plus this, what happens? The human nature will not be able to tolerate it. I mean, you're talking about the cops, they fast like four, four, four fifths of the, of the year. You add the Hebrew fasting, what would it be? We will need to have another two months to continue <laughs> to finish. The <laughs> yeah, yes, Monday and Thursday for the Jews, we fast Wednesdays and Fridays. So Jesus does not say, because some people look at this and say, oh, so Jesus didn't fast, the disciples didn't fast, we shouldn't fast. I said, no, he didn't say that. He said the fasting will start when I leave. When the bridegroom is taken, they will start fasting. And here we hear St. Paul in his letters, I, in many fastings, he says, in many fastings, he fasts. So there is a, the time of fast that St. Paul, book, uh, the book of Acts speak about, that the time of fast has, has gone. And then the last one he said, and no one having drunk old wine, old wine is, uh, has a lot of flavor. You know, people who knows wine, uh, old wine has a rich flavor to it. And people who are used to drink good old wine, they cannot really give them new wine. They will not be very excited about it. So he said, if the Jews had been having that wine for a long time, the system of fasting they have, they will not be happy to have the new. They will not taste it. It will not taste good for them. The church will understand that, the church will accommodate that, the church will continue that. And this will keep the old for the old and the new for the new. And here it says to us as a house, as a home, have that wine. Just have in your house Jesus and have that wine in your house. The wine of fasting. It's very good that with the house of the father and the children and the mother set up their schedule. Have a, have a schedule of fasting. We're going to fast the Lent. We're going to prepare for it. So to have Jesus amongst us in the, in the flesh, this will be the end of times when he comes. We will be with him forever. But now we have his fasts. We have his uh, word. We have his body and blood. And we keep them. And we keep them as a, as a family. You want to invite him and keep him in your house spiritually then keep also the fasts of the church. We are in St. Mary's fast. We have one week to be done. Let us do it if you had not done it. In Egypt, Muslims fast, believe it or not. St. Mary especially, they fast St. Mary's fast. And we sometimes ignore it. And sometimes we ignore the fasts of the church and we say, it's okay, we don't need to fast. No, we do. We really do. Uh, so in, there is the... I want to conclude with there's little time left because I've he I'm hearing a lot about the vaccines coming out and that you uh, will be, maybe we will have it here maybe in a couple of months or so. So whatever time left, try to use it wisely. Time for quietness, silence, prayer. Uh, pray in the morning, pray at night, pray before you eat. Spend time in nature. This, this is how we come closer to God. Um, come to liturgy and don't ignore it because it's open. Thank God we have uh, a big cathedral out here that we enjoy. And so uh, the nature. And so enjoy, enjoy those times and know that this will be ending soon. It will end soon. We're not going to have that forever. But let us use it wisely and, and get that time to serve us. Don't feel like you're in prison. This is discipline. And this is given by God so that we can be better. And enjoy today and enjoy your meal after the liturgy. God be with you all. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.